Good morning. At Cape Canaveral, the Space Shuttle Challenger is set and ready for a maiden voyage, but liftoff is now being threatened by upper atmospheric weather conditions. High shifting winds, the latest in a series of problems that have haunted the Challenger from its original launch date two and a half months ago right up to today, Monday, April the 4th, 1983. And good morning and welcome to today for this Monday morning. We hope your Easter weekend was a good one. I'm Bryant Gumbel, happy to be back alongside Jane Pauley here in New York. In this half hour, shortly, in fact, we're going to be going back live to the Kennedy Space Center for the latest on the launch, and we'll be talking with Deputy Director George Page about today's maiden voyage of Challenger. Jane? Hi. And in the news this morning, we have more on the situation at Cape Canaveral, where strong jet stream winds are threatening this afternoon's blast-off of the Space Shuttle Challenger. The Challenger's maiden launch on a five-day mission carrying four astronauts has already been delayed for two and a half months because of engine leaks. Science reporter Robert Bazell is standing by live this morning down at the Cape. Good morning, Bob. What's the story? John, good morning. A final decision about whether a launch is possible will not be made until about an hour before the scheduled launch time, which is 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The danger from high winds is that they could knock the shuttle off course, or even that wind shear could tear the spaceship apart. Air Force weather officers have been releasing balloons here this morning to measure those upper-level winds, and the latest reports are that the winds are decreasing, but it is still not certain they will decrease enough to allow the launch. Out on pad 39A, however, here at the Kennedy Space Center, all the preparations for the launch seem to be going smoothly. The new orbiter, the Challenger, appears to be ready to go into space after those two and a half months of delay caused by engine problems. Fuel has been loaded into the huge external fuel tank, and later on the four astronauts will go out to the pad to get ready. The goals of this mission are to test the Challenger, to take a new communication satellite into space, and to allow astronauts to take the first space walk from the Columbia. All that will be possible if those winds in the upper level atmosphere die down later on today. John? Again, liftoff for the Challenger, now set for 1.30 Eastern Time this afternoon. NBC News coverage of the launch begins at 1.30. Noon, NASA plans to launch the sixth space shuttle. This launch will be a little different, though, than those of the past, for this shuttle is a brand new machine. It's called the Challenger. So far, getting the spaceship off the ground has proved to be a real challenge to the engineers at NASA. On board for the Challenger's maiden voyage will be a four-man crew. Commander Paul Weitz is the only member of the crew to have flown in space before. He piloted the first mission of Skylab back in 1973. Pilot Carol Bobko is no stranger to the shuttle, though. He's been a capsule communicator and a chase pilot for the shuttle approach and landing tests. Also on board Space Shuttle 6 will be two mission specialists, Donald Peterson and Dr. Story Musgrave, the first medical doctor to fly on the shuttle. But he won't have much time to practice medicine. Both of those gentlemen will be busy attending to the flight's main order of business, and that is launching the TDRS. It's a huge communication satellite, the first in a system designed to improve communications between ground control and spacecraft. If all goes according to plan, both Patterson and Musgrave are scheduled to take a spacewalk on the fourth day of the flight to test out two brand new spacesuits. Space Shuttle Challenger's first flight and NASA's second business flight on the shuttle has been plagued with problems. Today's planned launch is already two and a half months late. Standing by at the Kennedy Space Center this morning, Deputy Director George Page. He's with our science correspondent, Bob Bozell. We're going to talk about some of the problems Challenger has had. Good morning to both of you. Morning. Bob, morning. let me get to you in a moment. Let me first start with Mr. Page. What's the key to your decision this afternoon, Mr. Page? Uh, Bob already told us you'll be making a decision sometime around noon. Well, right now, the, uh, the, the main uh, unknown, Byron, is the... Uh the status of the winds aloft up about 40,000 feet. Uh, they have been coming more out of the south than the vehicle can uh, take. And uh, our last check, they seem to be swinging to the west. And if they continue that trend, why well, we hope we'll be all right to fly. We noted the original liftoff date was January 27th. How much pressure are you under to get this thing off the ground today? Well, we're very anxious to get it off, but uh, there's no, nobody out here under any pressure to launch uh, one that we don't feel absolutely safe with. And uh, that's our first concern. And if we have any problem at all, we won't launch. We're not under that kind of pressure. Right now, you and your people are still optimistic about meeting the 83 timetable. If it's delayed today, will you still be able to meet the timetable? Yes, uh, we think we can still stand a few days. Now, the uh, downstream turnaround flows are going to be very tight because we are late on this one, as you mentioned, two months down. Now, we, ex we expect to be able to make that up, though. Uh, Mr. Page, one of the 
questions, I think, that in the public's mind is that there were leaks of hydrogen and oxygen from these engines, and these are two chemicals. When they come together, they could explode. Are you people absolutely convinced that there's no danger out there today? We are happier with these engines than we have been. Uh, we know more about them. We've, we've uh, come up with some more sophisticated leak check procedures, which we were forced into because of the problems, and uh, we are very confident with these engines. Now, to make up for all the problems that you've had with Challenger, when it finally does get up, you're going to go into a schedule here that's tighter than anything you could have imagined before. You're going to be people are 24 hours a day on a frantic schedule. Is there any danger that that's going to cause even more problems and that you people are just going to get into a worsening situation? Well, I don't like the term frantic. We're going to go on a, a busier schedule, and we, we are planning our crews now. We're, we're uh, putting our management people, spreading them out. Nobody's going to work 24 hours a day, but we will cover the job 24 hours a day. But, but it's a tough task. It is going to be tough. It's going to be tight. Again, we're going to do everything we can to, to hold the schedule. Uh, if we run into a problem, then the schedule's got to suffer. And the last question, if it doesn't go off today, how many days have we got before we're into another situation of weeks and weeks of delay? Oh, uh, we've got about uh, till Friday of this week, and then we've got to, if we're not off by then, the deciding factor is the ba are the batteries on the payload. We've got to go in and change those, and that's uh, probably a several-day task. So we hope that those winds in the jet stream uh, will right. more cooperate and we'll get Abs off today. Absolutely. We're, we're okay. very hopeful of that. Mr. Page, thank you very much. Sure. Brian? All right, Bob, thank you. And again, NBC will have full coverage. Of Here's where Morton Dean is standing by. Morning again, Morton. Good morning again, Bill. Since uh, last night, there's been some concern here at the Kennedy Space Center that the jet stream, those high-altitude winds, might force a postponement of the first flight of the shuttle Challenger. But General Abramson, James Abramson, who heads the program, was with us just a little while ago, and he said if it were up to him, and it is, he would fly. With me now is astronaut Tony England. Uh, Tony has been assigned to a future shuttle flight, but we're going to be talking about this flight. First of all, Tony, why worry about those high altitude winds? What could they do to the shuttle? Well, we designed the ascent trajectory uh, for an anticipated wind, and there's no changing that trajectory once we lift off. And if we go through a wind that we don't expect, the side loads on the vehicle can actually break it. And what do you mean so by the side loads? Well, if we go up through a wind shear, that's where the wind changes rapidly as, uh, as we uh, ascend. We go through this wind shear, and we'll get a wind on the side of the vehicle, and it'll load the wings. And the vehicle isn't made to be loaded that way during ascent. And uh, we're concerned with breaking it. But as you say, I don't think we're going to have a problem in this ascent. And as uh, everybody can see behind us, the weather down here on the ground is just picture perfect. Yes. Tony, one of the uh, big tasks ahead of the astronauts today, if all goes well, is the launching of a TDRS. And if I've got that right, it's a tracking and data relay system. Why is that important? It's a big satellite that right. will be launched from the shuttle itself. That's our TDRS, and we're counting on this satellite and its two cousins that we're going to launch on Flight 8 and on Flight 12 for all spacecraft communications in about two years. We're going to close down about a dozen of the worldwide uh, tracking stations. The ground and stations. The ground stations, that's right. And our budget is based on closing those stations. There isn't money in the budget to keep those open. So we, we have to get this, these, these satellites up and get them working. Uh, uh, and also, uh, it'll give us much better communications with our spacecraft than we have now. Right now, we, in some orbits, we have as little as 15% coverage from ground stations. When we have TDRS up there, we'll have more like 80%. And if my uh, homework serves me right, uh, I remember reading that the uh, new system will be able to handle 100 separate spacecraft at the same time and 32 shuttles or the other way around it's <laughs> anyway it's we right. have 32 shuttles right it's an impressive system or it really 32 is. satellites and 100 spacecraft yes. it's in there somewhere yes. let's move on to thursday mm -hmm. another big event the eva the yes. extravehicular activity the spacewalk that was uh, put off uh, during the last flight because both spacesuits uh, malfunctioned it was yes, a major these, are, these are new suits, and uh, in any development you have problems. But we're counting on being able to do EVAs with the shuttle system uh, to repair spacecraft, to uh, refuel them. It's a basic part of the shuttle system to be able to go out and do an EVA. So this is our first try at it, and we're counting on this working. And then we have to do it on 11, and then on 13, flight 13, we do our first repair. So, repair of a satellite in that's space. Right. Tony, that's right. thank you very much. You and now back to New York.
Thank you. Welcome this Monday morning, and as you can see at Cape Canaveral, the Space Shuttle Challenger is ready, set to go for its maiden voyage. But will it go? It's set for a 1.30 liftoff, but right now, launch officials are waiting until about noon Eastern time to make a final decision on whether or not the Challenger will lift off today. Evidently, there's some high shifting winds in the upper atmosphere that may delay that. Good morning again. I'm Brian Gumbel, back along with Jane Pauley at 8 o'clock. In just a moment, we'll be going. Thank you, Brian, and good morning, Jane. In the news this morning, NASA officials at Cape Canaveral say they will wait until about an hour before the scheduled 1.30 p.m. launch time before deciding whether to go ahead with the first mission of the Space Shuttle Challenger. High winds could force yet another postponement of this long-delayed flight. Our Bob Bazell is at Cape Canaveral this morning with more on the story. Good morning again, Bob. John, good morning. The Challenger, a brand new spaceship, is ready for its first flight into space. The only problem has been those winds in the upper atmosphere at about 40,000 feet. During the night, the winds were coming at speeds and direction which could have knocked the Challenger off course or even broken it apart. But we've just gotten the latest reading from an Air Force weather balloon that went up about an hour ago, and it indicates that the winds are shifting. They're now coming more from the west, and that's what NASA officials want. Now, as you mentioned before, there hasn't been a final decision yet about whether it's go for launch. That decision will not be made until about an hour before launch, but it is starting to look a lot better. Out on the pad, meanwhile, everything is going smoothly in the countdown. Fuel has been loaded into the huge external fuel tank. In a little while, the astronauts, Bob Coe, Weitz, Peterson, and Muzzle, grave will go out to begin the final preparations for liftoff. If the winds do cooperate, we'll have a launch here at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. John? Bob, and we'd like to remind you that NBC News coverage of that launch will begin at 1.20 p.m. Eastern Time. But both of them seem to have been corrected. If Challenger does blast off as scheduled, it will be a very long day for the astronauts. They will send up their huge communication satellite, the biggest ever taken up, uh, just before midnight tonight. And then, of course, on Thursday, the planned spacewalk, the one that was canceled the last time because of those suit failures. The spacewalk would be the first for American astronauts in nine years. All of that, of course, assuming that Challenger leaves the pad on time this afternoon. Steve? Thank you, Lynn. And if all does go well, ABC News will carry the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger live beginning at 1.25 Eastern Time. Canaveral are causing a few difficulties concerning the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. NASA officials say high-altitude winds of up to 100 miles an hour are too strong for a safe launch, but they are hopeful that the winds will die down before the launch scheduled for 1.30 this afternoon. A few minutes ago, we talked to the Cape. You're seeing a live picture there now, and they are much more optimistic at this hour that the launch will go on as schedule. And if all goes well, NBC will begin coverage of the launch this afternoon at 1.20 Eastern Time. And I'm Bobby Batista. And I'm Jim Wilkerson. While the countdown continues for the 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Challenger. This will be the Challenger's maiden flight. High winds about 40,000 feet above the shuttle did threaten the scheduled launch, but a launch control spokesman said this morning the shuttle is now ready to go. Deborah Lindner reports on what the shuttle hopes to accomplish. Crucial to the success of this sixth shuttle mission is the launching of a two-and-a-half-ton tracking and data relay satellite, one of three to be launched by 1984. Together, they will establish an almost continuous communications link between mission control and shuttle astronauts. That network is a key element in future missions, especially Skylab. Astronauts must also perfect the art of spacewalking on this mission. Thursday's planned spacewalk by mission specialists Story Musgrave and Donald Peterson is the first in nearly a decade. NASA has taken great pains to see that there will be no repeat malfunctions in the $2 million spacesuits which plagued STS-5. Those malfunctions have since been blamed on careless inspection and faulty workmanship. The Challenger crew will include a veteran of the first Skylab program 10 years ago, Commander Paul Weitz, and pilot Carol Bobko. The astronauts will be handling a number of experiments first begun on previous missions, including the electrophoresis system, a continuous experiment to determine the effects of zero gravity on certain materials. Absent from this mission will be news about the astronauts' physical conditions. After complaints about the crew's publicized nausea on STS-5, NASA will now keep all information strictly confidential, unless it threatens the mission. Overall, officials will be watching closely the performance of Challenger to determine if it is a viable backup to Columbia in the interchangeable shuttle program. 
Deborah Lindner, CNN. For her maiden voyage. Hello, I'm Bobby Batista. And I'm Jim Wilkerson. The jet stream winds that threatened the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger have now subsided, and NASA has given the go-ahead for liftoff in two hours. Weather balloons have been released hourly to monitor the winds, which had threatened another postponement. From the Kennedy Space Center, CNN's Tom Yentier has a live update on the situation. Tom? Jim, the astronauts are on board the shuttle orbiter right now, sitting on pad 39A here at the Kennedy Space Center, going through some last-minute checks of switches and buttons to make sure everything is A-OK -okay as the countdown progresses down to the last few minutes. That The hold that was in place at uh, three hours until the launch time went so smoothly that they started the count on schedule and have continued to count down as the minutes pass by. Right now, the last-minute checks, some last-minute weather briefings are going on. Some jet aircraft are overhead checking the high-altitude winds just to make sure that nothing delays this launch of the shuttle. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of shuttle watchers and still photographers are waiting along Florida's beaches to watch the Challenger's maiden launch, and CNN's Tom Mintier has more on that. Time the space shuttle is launched, thousands of still photographs are snapped as the shuttle roars out of sight. The spectacular views are mostly the work of professional photographers. They work for newspapers, magazines, industrial firms associated with the space program, and many just shoot for the fun of it. At the Kennedy Space Center, all of the major camera manufacturers are lined up in a row at the press center. While it may look like a photo shopping center, most of this equipment is not for sale. The companies come here not only to photograph the shuttle, but to loan equipment to other photographers. The free service is extensively used, and the photo people make repairs just in case something breaks at the last minute. Other photographers bring their cameras here for a quick cleanup to ensure nothing goes wrong on launch day because there's no second chance. The cameras use a sound activation system that starts the camera as soon as the shuttle fires its engines. Picking your remote camera location near the launch pad takes plenty of experience and a pair of wading boots, not only for the water, but to protect you from bugs and snakes. Many of the cameras are set up in waist-deep water to get a reflecting shot of the launch. Others are placed at different angles to record the entire flight, visible for only 90 seconds. So the next time you see a photograph of a space shuttle launch, remember, there wasn't anyone standing behind the camera clicking it, but the photographer may have risked becoming dinner for an alligator just for one eight by 10. Tom Intier, CNN at the Kennedy Space Center. Approximately one half hour from now, the Space Shuttle Challenger will blast off on its two million mile, five day voyage around the Earth. The Challenger was given the go ahead for its 1.30 p.m. Eastern time flight after weather balloons indicated jet stream winds had subsided. Technicians were concerned the 100 plus mile per hour winds would create unacceptable stress on the shuttle. Co-pilot Carol Bobko and his three crew members have entered the shuttle now. In addition to putting the shuttle into orbit, they're also scheduled to deploy an important communication satellite 10 hours after blastoff. Meanwhile, today's launching of the Space Shuttle Challenger drew thousands of shuttle watchers to Florida's Space Coast. CNN's Tom Mentier reports. On launch day, finding a place to watch the liftoff of the Space Shuttle is as hard to find as a four-leaf clover. Hotel and motel rooms all along the central coast of Florida are reserved months in advance. The launching of Challenger, the sixth time NASA has put up a shuttle, is drawing huge crowds. For college students, it's spring break. For everyone else, it's Easter weekend. Campers and pup tents dot the coastline. People come to the shuttle launchings to have a good time and to see a little bit of history on the same trip. But this launch is drawing a lot of first-timers. Well, we're doing a tour of the thing, and this happened to be going on during our tour, right? So we figured it would be a good place to camp for a couple days and catch it. This is the first time. Why'd you come down? We've been watching it on TV for all the flights, and we just wanted to see one in person. Some people may call these folks tourists. They buy souvenirs, specially designed for the Challenger mission. But most people who live around here or work for NASA don't call them tourists. They call them taxpayers. This area is also called by some Disney World West because the Kennedy Space Center has so many visitors now. For the hundreds of thousands of people who come to see the space shuttle launches, it only appears to them as a glimmer of fire in the sky as it races from the launch pad to outer space. But they say they don't really mind. It's just being here when the shuttle lifts off of pad 39A that's important to them. Tom in tears.